good. Hey, everybody. My guest today is Bernie Telsey. Bernie is an award-winning casting director who has been casting since the 1980s and along with his incredible team is responsible for casting many shows like Rent, Wicked, Hamilton, In the Heights, The Color Purple, Days of Wine and Roses, Kimberly Akimbo, Into the Woods, Sweeney Todd, Parade, Some Like It Hot, the upcoming uh, cabaret that's coming in 2024, listeners of the future and past, and so many more. Some of his zillions of film credits include the film adaptation of Wicked, The Color Purple, and Mean Girls, The Musical, Theater Camp, The Little Mermaid, Tick, Tick, Boom, Mary Poppins Returns, In the Heights, The Greatest Showman, Into the Woods, Sex in the City, One and Two, Across the Universe, and many more. And for television, and just like that, Only Murders in the Building, The Gilded Age, Tracker, Schmigadoon, Fosse Verdon, This Is Us, We Crashed, Jesus Christ Superstar, Live, Smash, so many more. But also, we are here today to celebrate a theater that means so much to me and so many of us who have known and loved Bernie and Bobby and Will. And we'll get into all of that called Manhattan Class Company that was born in 1982. Five eighty six. 86, you can tell me. Um, welcome, Bernie Telsey, my friend and hero oh, so to nice the podcast. To see you. <laughs> oh. Thanks for having me. Oh my God, this is incredible. I really think of all the people on this podcast, you really may be one of the people I've known the longest. I really feel like I've grown up with you. And so many really meaningful moments in my early days in New York include Bernie Telsey. Um, yeah. Not just because one of the first shows I did was Forgetting Frankie. Do you remember who was in yes. that cast? Yes, who was the in class it? Class One X. Yes, Ken Marks, Connie Ray, you, Laura Linney, and uh, I'm blanking. Meg. On one. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, no wait, Meg. Beautiful, Meg. beautiful. Was it Meg? The the woman we're thinking of isn't acting anymore, but she was a dancer. And truly, the reason I'm forgetting her name is she was too pretty. Like, she was, like, <laughs> looking into the sun. She was so beautiful. But truly, like, Laura, Linny, and Connie Ray and Ken became, like, when you think about your first friends in the business, the people who you do your very first one acts with, yeah. Manhattan Class Company, you had been an actor for a minute. Yeah. Um, understudying Matthew Broderick. Yes, yeah, in Bright Beach Memoirs. Just talk yeah. for two minutes about that. Uh well, I How did you get that part? Uh cuz I was also had just started being a casting assistant doing the bookkeeping at Meg Simon and Fran Cumin. Uh I was doing their books and their accounting like part-time like right out of school and they were casting the show and then Meg Simon saw me do a reading that Carol Rothman was directing at Second Stage and then Meg said, come in and audition for this part. And I did. And at the same time, the great fun story about that is they were also looking for an understudy for Jelko Ivanic and, you know, weren't finding it. And then I was like a, a baby casting assistant. Cause I was like, well, I know this actor happens to be my roommate, Patrick Breen. Like, what about giving him a shot and cut to, we both got the job and we both got our equity cards and sent us off to San Francisco to understudy the show. And then they, they liked him more because he stayed and replaced Jelko. <laughs> but I quickly got out of, out of acting. So Patty um, Breen, um, who who right before COVID shut us down, we did uh, The Perplex together, this Richard Greenberg play. Um, and I had forgotten that you guys had been roommates. It came up at that time. And did you guys go to NYU together? Is yeah, that we how you... were NYU undergrad, yeah. Okay, so coming out of NYU, I was not a part of this group. I got into Naked Angels because I, I knew Michael Greif and he brought me in to do a play there. But this is around the same time that these incredible yes. theater companies are forming. Starting up, yeah. Yes, by the way, I wanna do a whole other podcast about why you were doing accounting, like, <laughs> I don't even I don't even understand. It was the that one part. good advice my mother gave me. She said, You're gonna need a fallback. <laughs> Take oh accounting. God. And I took accounting at NYU. Oh my God. Suddenly you sound so Long Island. Are you from Long Island? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Just tell me about Bernie as a kid for a moment. Like if we could flash back if this were a film and we suddenly like went back to like Bernie as a kid 
in on Long Island. What was what what were you doing? What did you love? Day camp. I mean, I just loved going to day camp. You know, I went to Elmont Jewish Center day camp, and that's where I sort of fell in love with the theater because, you know, they were putting on shows, and you know, one minute I was a Von Trapp son in Sound and Music, and the next minute I was Tevya at twelve years old. You know, uh, and I loved it. I mean, I just fell in love with it, and then got more involved in it in high school. You know. I had sort of a boring suburban life and I had a big jock school. So I had no sense of inclusion at school. But then we in high school started a little drama department because it wasn't a school that really put on shows, just put on fundraisers for the for the sports teams. Right. And I found a way in of like, oh, I'll start this drama department and then I'll come up with this variety show idea that I'll help raise money for the cheerleaders and the football players and sort of found my way in to those people who, you know, for many years had no idea I existed. Right. You know, now I was putting together this, you know, big variety show for them. So that's sort of, but it was really getting involved in a community theater that really sort of changed my life and taught me about theater management, made me have my dream of wanting to go to NYU to start a theater company. You which know. you did, which you, you did, um, which is, you know, is so celebrated for not only kind of bringing new work into um, the New York theater scene, but so much incredible programming that you do outreach with kids and sort of getting theater beyond just the usual crowd who come to see theater. I saw Gavin's Walk On Through a few months ago. I just saw The Connector. I've seen so many things. MCC now has the most gorgeous theater um, I think about as, you know, Building. we read the paper yeah. each day and like these, these institutions are losing their, their real estate, which is really the heart and soul of what keeps a theater going for the most part. And while that's happening, your theater is expanding and is so extraordinarily beautiful and folks at home. Sometimes you go to the theater and Bernie Telsey is right there, like to greet you when you arrive. I want to explain to people that Maybe they know this, maybe they don't, but I feel like, you know, everyone in their career has like this lucky thing that sort of changed the course of their careers. And I'm going to say, as I think about you, that casting Rent was like a total game changer, certainly in terms of me not having to like just veil about you to all the people I know, but everyone already knowing who you are without me telling them. So is that in your sort of hindsight, correct? Yeah. Yes. I mean, that really sort of put me on the map as a casting director. Yeah. I was doing the Hartford stage and stuff at the Goodman and of course MCC, but that was a real game changer. Cause like an actor who gets a role that people then see them in and then they go, Oh wow. I didn't know they could do that. All of a sudden that show became such a, a beautiful show as, and on its own right. But then it also got some recognition for all of these new actors getting seen and discovered and recognized so then it was like, well, who did the casting? And then because it was my first Broadway show, then it gives other producers the acceptability to go, okay, well now come do this show for me or come do this. So it really, you know, made me go from a staff of two to what we have now. Yeah. You know, and offices like, in LA and yeah. and so and and the reach so far beyond yeah. just theater, as if that isn't enough. I think And it taught me so much about casting working. So on that's what I wanted to know. First of all, what gave you the sort of courage? I mean, Meg Simon and Fran Cumin were like legends uh in the world of casting, both theater and television. I mean, they did a lot of things. Um, the idea of going out on your own as a young person, what gave you the confidence or even the idea like that you were going to start your own company? Uh, you know, it wasn't that, it sort of wasn't as smart as that because, <laughs> you know, I left Megan Fran because at that time the the MCC was taking off. Right. Or I thought it was taking off. Even because though. of what play? Like when you think back not, to not the just time because or the just it was, was happening. Just, it was happening. You know yeah. I mean? Whether we moved Beirut to off-Broadway or not, it was just... Now that's happening and that's really where I want to be. Mm -hmm. So I need to go bartend or do something so I could do MCC full time instead of just in the evenings after hours. Got it. And that was why I left. And Got then it. I met Risa Brayman and Billy Hopkins, who at that time were casting all of these 
hot New York movies and they were directors in their own right. And we met and they said, you know, we need help. Come do freelance with us. You could do your own projects and you could still do MCC even during the day, you know, whatever you need. We'll make it work. We'll make it work because that's how they Yeah. Uh, So I worked for them for two years and it was a a love fest uh, and learned a lot about, you know, running your own project. Uh, And we started doing these commercials because people called them because they were the, you know, groovy. Cool New York. uh, Directors. And, you know, so they had me do these commercials and we did this Richard Avedon IBM commercial that I put you know, Bob Joy in and Mary Joy and Larry Brigman and Ron Vodder from the Worcester group. And it just took off as in the commercial, in the commercial ad agency. And then the ad agencies just started calling and Reese and Billy, rightly so, were like, we have no time for this. We're too cool. We're not doing these commercials. Why don't you just go do it? Just go open up a shed and do the commercials. And so I did, and it was a great way to make a living while doing the theater company, because I could even do it, you know, at the little theater office that we had and rent a studio and put people on tape for commercials. And that's sort of what made me have my own business. And then because of that, people that I, you know, at that time, Megan Fran had already stopped doing it. So people that I knew from those days would call. And it was really uh, Peter Sellers who at the time had always used Meg, was doing a rock opera uh, called I Was Looking at the Ceiling and Then I Saw the Sky, which no one has ever heard of. Uh, But it was a rock opera and they would describe it like to be like Rent, even though Rent didn't exist. They wanted a young multicultural cast to not just sing like opera, but to really sing. And I did that show and it was really, really hard. And then no one saw it. It was like a Berkeley rep. And, but Jim Nicola saw it, who ran New York Theater Workshop. And then he called and said, we have a rock opera called Rent. And I was like, oh, I can't do this again. I mean, it was so hard. And I thought, I know. And he said, well, I need someone to do Rent and Quills. And I tell this joke all the time, not joke. I say to young actors, you better have a good reason to say no. And he said, will you do Quills and Rent? And I said to Jim, is there any way I could just do quills? (laughs) I'm right. Like uh, that would have been really smart. Right. And he said, no. And I said, okay, I'll do rent. And then, you know, it was the best experience to this day. Uh, And not just because of the success. It taught me everything about casting and how hard it is and challenging and exciting to see new talent that you would not know. Mm -hmm. It's like, you could cast Death of a Salesman in your sleep by just thinking of the actors that you love. Right, right. It was like, I'm not going to know who anybody is. They're 20 and they sing rock and pop. Right. So I had to be a detective, you know, and it was at the time when no one wanted to do an off-Broadway musical. You know, no one knew who anybody was that was working on it. Right. So it was really challenging, but at the same time, so fun to be in a room with Jonathan and Michael and, Tim Wilde, the musical director, for about a year and a half. I mean, they set it up correctly. Mm-hmm. You know, there was no money being made by anybody. It was like this, you know, Jonathan knew this is going to take forever because nobody on Broadway can sing like this now, which at that time they weren't like they are now. There's a million rock and pop shows. Right. So, you know, every week we would do auditions for like a year right. until we found that cast. So And... And right. so the kind of meta of it all or full circle of it all, when when you're casting Tick, Tick, Boom and sort of seeing Lynn and everyone, sort of all the cameos, and then it just sort of, that must have been such- ah, It was so great. And time travel, yeah. right? Yeah, like, totally. like where I, am I? Yeah. You know, and everyone wanted to be part of that movie and Lynn did such, such an amazing job. Uh, but yeah, because- I was around Jonathan all those times. I I know, I know. It's just so incredible. You know, I see his face like it was yesterday. Um, And he's always young. He, you know, he doesn't age, you know, when I, when I see him. Like us, we don't age. Like us, like us. There's no Zoom filter. What are you talking about? How dare you? Um, (laughs) 
I do wonder, you know, I think about sort of the few times I've sort of stepped to the other side of the desk where, you know, we I produced a movie, Ira and Abby, that you guys cast, yeah. and it was so incredible to um to be behind the table. Um, you know, reading Christmas scene of four, our film yeah. rather than yeah. reading with Christmas scene of four <laughs> film. Um, how do you handle, uh, because you were an actor, because you went to NYU, you had all these friends that you kind of started out as an actor together. Has it been tricky over the years to kind of just manage the fact that you are in a position of opening doors for people and knowing all these people we're older now and it's less of a thing. Like everyone has made their own way. Was that a, a complicated thing to negotiate or did it sort of give you an opportunity to champion your friends? Yeah, it really did. I mean, I never saw it as something I had to negotiate. You know, I mean, it's funny when you say it that way, because it's, it could so easily be, and it still could be, but mm -hmm. I feel like, that is my job, right? Mm -hmm. To introduce, to, you know, encourage actors to be seen. And you can't, you know, long as I could try to explain, it doesn't mean I could get everyone hired. Mm -hmm. so you know so many more people than the amount of roles that you're actually casting. Right. Um, and if you're just, you know, the key word of today, if you're just honest about it and transparent about it, it, it never got in the way, oddly enough. It's okay, yeah. And I think... And maybe the luck was because I got to do MCC at the same time. So I wasn't just seen as the sort of gatekeeper in casting or the person who says no, because then, like you say, then I'm doing a play at MCC and I'm here every night and I have a different relationship with the actors than I might in the room. And I just try to bring the MCC relationship into the room. Like we're all artists working right. together. Right. And we can make it, if the match works for this, it will. And if not, it doesn't mean you're not liked and yeah, 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 yeah. It just means so I don't know. How do you keep I mean, I really have to say it it is first of all, the 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 funnest part, and I'll and I did say funnest, of auditioning in the old offices and the new offices, um, is the number of people that you love that you run into. So right. so truly like the the party that is Telsey casting. A, because you have 1 million things going on at all times. So it really is like, you never have to worry about there being enough people. There will be a party. Um, it is an incredible thing to to have this um, artistic home in an audition room. H how is it that I feel like everyone who works for you understands that community is being created even while you're sort of making these jobs come together and, and match with directors. Like, I mean, is that a mentality? Is yes, that something curate? I love that you picked up on that because that was like a goal of mine back in the early days of like, no, I want the space to feel like it's an okay space, even though most of the people who are leaving are going to not get the job. Right. But how do we make it a community? I mean, to me, the waiting room was always as important as what was happening inside in the, the room. So that it could feel like, you know, I'm going to the, you know what I mean? Like I'm going yeah. to today and work is yes. the, and, and yes, you know, and so these are my coworkers and my yeah. colleagues and my, right. yeah, my not work my family. Competitors. Yes, yes. It's a given that we're competing for this, competing for the same job, but I don't feel that way, the way with my friends who are casting directors. I'm very close with so many. Cause it's like, yeah, we're all meeting for the same jobs and whoever gets it, gets it. But if we could just make it more human. Uh, so that was a goal. Like I talk about that, whether the employees started yesterday or lucky for me, most of the employees have been here 15, 20 some odd years. Yeah, it's incredible. And it's part of the gestalt. Yeah, of, you know? of Telsey casting. Right. Um, and, and now being in the same building as the theater company, it naturally happens on a different way because- things are rehearsing here. I know, it's so awesome. It's oh, so awesome what you've done. Um, a lot of actors, as you know, uh, have been on this show and sort of the great fun and centerpiece is sort of uh, things that went wrong along the way. We are very aware of sort of blowing an audition or just things that happen in a room. What does that look like from the casting side? Like, like, 
you you think you're reading for Anne and then you walk in the room and they're like, no, you're reading for Sally. And you're like, not, I didn't know nothing. What are things that, are there any things that you can share without your integrity being at stake or future work where you're like, oh my God, fuck ups. Of course we have them too. This happened. Uh, like, did you ever offer the same part to two people by mistake? No, no. <laughs> okay. that would be... I'm uh, thinking what's the worst thing that could happen? in your, on your side of the desk? Oh, that you have a creative team that doesn't like anybody that you've scheduled for the entire day. Nope. Uh, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and no matter what you're saying or doing or, uh, nope, it's just <laughs> not. You speak and different you know, languages. Yeah, and it's the same thing, right? I have to give myself the note that we say to actors all the time, okay. It's a process. Mm -hmm. you no, know, there's always tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It'll be a better day. Or now I've learned something about the roles so that maybe I have to schedule a different kind of person for next week's session. But uh, that's when there's egg on the face, when there's like, they didn't like anyone. Not uh, one, not one person. Yeah. And you know, I don't take it personally, uh, <laughs> but it's not fun, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but uh you know, or another thing is like when you're uh, pitching an actor that you're really behind and you're so excited and you're telling the team like, wait, when you see so-and-so and then they don't show up, you know, because they've canceled while you're in the session because they're no longer available. And you're like, in, you know, foot insert, you know, now he's never or she's never going to like anybody else because, you know, you just told them who they were going to see that they're not seeing. Uh so those kinds of things, you know, but there's always another wonderful actor. That's the great thing. There's mm -hmm. so many unbelievable actors. Uh, so once you get back into the car, it's like roller skating, get back yeah. up, keep going. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we have the same kind of day an actor has. Right. I mean, I imagine you've also had to handle... Uh, it's it's you're inviting actors into your home and you're inviting producers and directors and creators into your home and a people pleaser myself I want to make sure that everyone is oh. doing well um how do you handle because because it's your session and then it's the director's session also have you had to handle situations where like frankly you just don't love the way the creative team is talking to the actors or sort of behaving in the room. Is that something you talk about? If I cast your show, this is sort of how the room works or is it more intuitive than that? Uh, okay, great question. You, you know, it's the thing we as a casting team in the office talk about all the time. And especially today, more so than we did yeah. 10 years ago because yeah. it's a big, big part of it. So we... Talk about it without trying to make it like we're the teacher who know everything and we're the rule makers. You know what I mean? But, you know, a big word that we use a lot is, you know, something we've learned recently. This is really a much more inclusive way to have the auditions be held. You know, you know what I mean? Or things like that. So it right. is intuitive. But like you said earlier, we're the host of the party, right? We're the host of the dinner or the luncheon or whatever is happening. And we have to always be on track to make sure that the room is running favorably and behaviorally, you know what I mean? Right, 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 and, then, and respectfully. Yeah, and then the challenge is, you know, it's a selective taste business, how to get six to 12 people who could be the decision makers all to agree on something, mm -hmm. challenge in an art in itself. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's like the day after, I always say it's like the day after Thanksgiving when you had all these relatives over and we're not going to cook, we're just going to get pizza. You can't even figure out the same pizza to get for everyone because everybody likes a different thing. Exactly. No dairy, cheese, mushrooms, pepper, yes. no meat, meat. And that's what casting is like. Everyone has a different, they're coming to the table with a different sense of what they imagine that they wrote or are producing or directing and your job is to try to get everyone on the same collective page. And that's, I love that actually. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, but uh, that's the sort of, it's so much more than just the actor in their audition. 
Uh, how are you? How I mean, I I I would be so remiss if we didn't talk about, and I can't believe this is how I will describe him, but the great late Bobby Lapone, who was just um in my early days in New York, when Bobby would walk through the halls, um, it was a great feeling. It was just a really great feeling to be around him as a performer because he was so talented and he was such a champion of other artists. Um, how did you first meet Bobby? Just just to be clear, if I didn't say it earlier, Bobby Lapone, Bernie Telsey, and was Will was Will Killer well, like an original? Two. Okay, like, you know, like early two. days. Yeah, yeah, way there, but like a year later. <laughs> okay, so he's the baby of the bunch. A year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how did you and Bobby Lapone? first meet each other and come up with this idea to do this together. God, I, I miss him every friggin' day. Uh, you know, here we were at NYU and I'll do the short version, you know, part of the acting wing, even though I was also doing the theater management, but the acting wing, you're at all these different studios. Like now there's the Atlantic. At that time, there wasn't. There was the Actors and Directors Lab, which was on Theater Row on 42nd Street. It was run by Jack Garfine, who was a disciple of Harold Clerman. And, you know, as any young actor, you're told in the senior year, you're going to get acting class with Jack Garfine. So you're like, you know, it's January, it's our last semester. And it's like, we're finally getting Jack Garfine, who we've been hearing about. I personally was hearing about because I also did a work study at the studio, you know, to pay for NYU. And it's like the first day back from the winter break. And Bob Lapone walks in and we're told he's going to be our guest teacher because Jack Garfine is not available to do it. And, you know, you had a, about 20 not so happy young people. And, you know, you knew Bobby as a musical theater uh, performer at the time. And we were all drama students. And, you know, Bobby's first sentence, which you know Bobby, so, and I love this about him now, but then he's like, so I'm here teaching this class. Let me just start by telling you, I've never taught before and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and we were like, great. Uh, great. This is why we're great. spending all this money at NYU. Yeah. I'm in debt, Bobby Lapone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, what are you talking about? And cut to, that was at a time where he had already left Chorus Line and he was in his own right, leaving the musical theater and wanted to be a legit actor and was studying on Monday at Stella Adler, Tuesday at Lee Strasberg, Wednesday at, you know, Bob Krakow, you know, Bill Esper. And he said, whatever I'm learning, I'm gonna teach you. Uh -huh. And he was an amazing shit detector. And it winded up being this incredible class because it was so honest. Mm -hmm. It's like probably what we needed as we were getting ready to get out of school. Yeah. And then, you know, here it was May and we're getting out of school and we're just getting started. And, you know, being the administrator organizer that I was, it was like, so you want to like teach over the summer, you know, and like, well, you know, and there was like seven of us that wanted to. And I was like, I'll take it on. I manipulated my way into free space at NYU somehow and then worked with Bobby around his schedule or whatever he was doing. And he started teaching this class over the summer, which then led to, oh, I have a friend who's a playwright. Let's all read it. And I was already mm -hmm. then working at Megan Franz. And it was like, well, if we don't have something within the group of seven, like I'll ask someone to do the reading. Right. You know, I, I just saw Cherry Jones audition for Meg Simon. I'll see if she wants to, you know what I mean? I mean, it was like, you know. Like that. Like that. Yeah. And then we got to be friendly and close and, you know, and I was like, okay, we went from a class to a club and then together it was like, oh, well, let's start a theater. I had, I know how to do that because I know how to get not-for-profit status and that's why I went to NYU, blah, 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 blah. And he was really into it. You know, he'll always say like, I didn't want to do it. You forced me. You know, you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. together we started this theater company. Yeah. And it just sort of like then naturally happened. And uh, there isn't a day that went by that I didn't talk to him. Right. Not only, you know, partners, we were best friends, you know. Yeah. And what happens when 
I mean, this isn't Anderson Cooper's podcast about grief, but I do think about- but My wife gave me that and made me listen to that after Bobby passed and I was blown away. It's Never. extraordinary. It was so helpful, not yeah. to change the subject, but boy. No, 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 I, I agree. Amazing. For me, it was amazing. Yes, same. It's a really special conversation <laughs> that he has. Um, and also so incredibly vulnerable himself about it. And it's an incredible thing when you when you're used to seeing someone doing news, right, in this very objective way, and then suddenly just like bearing his soul in that way. Um, but I think about it as we, you know, for for many of us as we watch the in memoriams each year, it it's it it hits hard and it hits home. And the Bobby of it all, I think about like when you lose your creative partner, it's a marriage and you've lost a, a artistic and, and a spouse in yeah. that way. Um, how do you, how are you doing with that? Uh, you know, in many ways, I'm even more in it than I could ever be. Because mm -hmm. uh, I do feel personally, there's a, like, I got to get this up for him. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not to sound corny, but like the theater's on 52nd Street and I live on 44th Street. So whenever I go home, I'm like, I walk home by myself, whereas everyone else is going the other way to the subway or whatever. And I talk to him mm. like on the way home. You know what I mean? Like for real. Like yeah, people say that, but that's really your experience no, it's like, of it. It's, yeah. you know, it's a little bit of recapping what the fuck happened today. <laughs> you know, like whether it's, you know, we didn't get this grant or we got this grant or right. it was in great shape or, oh my God, the preview was so bad. I don't even know what we're going to do. And sometimes I'm like, you know what? This would have been your thing to handle. Where the fuck are you? I am so mad you at you right now. Like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's For sure. You know, there's one or two specifics that have happened in the last year that like <laughs> show Bob Lapone. And it was like, <laughs> I don't, I don't even know what to do because right. I never would have done that. And now, oh. you know, uh, so and I feel like this year specifically, it was all about timing, but the fact that we're doing three musicals back to back. It's a lot. It's such a dream that we wanted to do with getting the new space. Yeah. It's where I feel he would have loved that so much. Yeah. Because, you know, being a well, musical man. Being the musical man that he was yeah. trying to move yeah. away from, but we wouldn't let him because he's such a delicious musical man in that yeah. way. Um, how thrilling, you know, as we sort of come to an end, of this episode, I feel like the idea that this, you know, let's read a Peter Hedges play uh, to to <laughs> let's let's premiere the the most recent Jason Robert Brown, Jonathan Mark Sherman, everyone with three names uh, who's doing a magnificent new musical um, in this gorgeous space. We're coming up, you know, when this airs, another incredible thing. I don't know who conceptualized it, but there's something called. People in Singapore are listening to this, so I have to fill in a little bit of the of the watercolor here with paint, which is miscast is this um, gala event that has been going on for years now, um, which would be great if you could explain it to the to the people at home, why it's such a special thing and what it means to the community. Yeah, it's a it's this is our 24th year of doing it. And, you know, every not for profit theater has a gala or a fundraiser. And uh, my dear, dear friend, Scott Whitman, who at the time uh, when I was casting Hairspray, he was the lyricist of Hairspray. He gave me the idea and said, you need to do something different. You know, you should do this miscast thing. You're in casting. It's a great way to tie the theater company with what you do as a casting director. And came up with this great title, Miscast, which, you know, even though I think I don't love the definition of the word and we've tried to twist it a little bit, but it's a chance for people to get to sing roles that they would not traditionally be cast in. Right. And for actors who are asked to do benefits all the time, it wind up becoming a, a way in that was different than them just getting up and singing a song. Right. You know, it was learning something new. It was getting to do something that I don't normally get to do. Uh, even though now, you know, we're not going to have a woman sing Bobby because a woman played Bobby in company. Right. So there were the days where we did that, you know, yeah. like, I want to see Katrina Link do Tevya like she did at Miscast. Unbelievable. <laughs> that will probably happen in the next 10 years. Right. But yeah. either way, it's such a great way for actors to feel like they're also in a gymnasium getting to stretch, getting to do something that they don't normally get to do, even though it's a benefit. And we try to make it, it's so much about the fun 
than it is about the Aman Carnegie Hall singing. That's right. I mean, like all the actors are on stage together. So you as an audience have so much fun watching them see each other like a game show in that yeah. way. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It, it, and it is the this- most... The I couldn't imagine other than maybe a Taylor Swift concert, a more effusive <laughs> wannabe there crowd. Yeah. Um, we are there for it and the performers are there for it. And the great thing is, even though downstairs we have the benefit tickets, which are all people who, thank the Lord, are supporting MCC. What's nice is by the time we get to the evening where we're just doing miscasts after we do all the MCC stuff, then we open up the balcony, which is another 500 seats. And those are the theater fans that are coming. So you hear that energy at the Hammerstein Ballroom. Uh, and, you know, and then the YouTube videos went on and on. And, you know, so it's just- It would been- be like people who haven't been, imagine Jeremy Jordan singing Mama Rose. Like, yeah. like it, it, that's literally sort of the thing. And of course, because it is a Jeremy Jordan or a Kelly O'Hara or whoever it is, it's actually the most brilliant version of the thing that yes, you could exactly. possibly imagine. Exactly. Actually, Jeremy singing- Rose's turn would be a great, I don't know if that's happened yet. Uh, we did with Raul saying it. Raul saying it. <laughs> Raul I knew, saying okay. It. <laughs> no new ideas. Um, but no, right. no, it's been, it's April 15th this year. Monday, 2024. 15th. Yep, 2024. Yes. But it's so much fun to put together. But it's funny, you said one other thing when you said, starting with the Peter Hedges reading and circling to the present day of Jason Robert Brown, we're actually developing a musical that Peter Hedges is writing. So yes. talk about full circle, he is, we have been developing What's Eating Gilbert Grape, the musical, which he wrote the novel and the screenplay, and now is writing and directing uh, the musical version. Well, so going to be up soon, next year. I, you know, Peter lives three blocks away from me and I bump into him all the time. And um, we've been figuring out you know, people want to come on the show when there's something specific to talk about. I actually love people coming on the show when they're not worrying about a project and we can just sure. talk about, you know, Elmont, you know, JCC. But <laughs> um, but that's 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 what we'll get Peter on for. All, all right. right. Before I let you go, first of all, I love you. And I love you. it I makes you. me just so happy to see you and just have like a moment, just the two of us to I catch know. up. It's I the know. best. Um <laughs> Is Thanks. there a little known fact that you can share about yourself? <gasps> uh, that I have a beautiful wife and two kids and a daughter-in-law, but no, it's not a fact. But I mean, well, it is a fact. It, it is a uh, fact. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's 100% I, 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 a fact. <laughs> define, so Alexa, define too. fact. Um, uh, that I'm a really, really good bowler. That's, I had no that's idea. Something. Yeah, I'm a really good bowler. That was my that was my sports growing up. And you said you were sporty, <laughs> Bernard Telsey. Um, thank you. Congratulations right. on a beautiful artistic life. Oh, well thank lived, you. Sharing thank you. sharing it with so many people in so many ways. Mwah. I will oh, see you soon. Say hi to your lovely husband. I will say hi to everyone in that office and your lovely wife and kids right. and daughter-in-law. All, All right. right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.